So I'm a prevention specialist here. My name is Jay Peddley, and I'm probably not too familiar. You've seen me over there. I don't have any business, allegedly, in treatment because I'm a prevention specialist. And prevention and treatment, and I am reminded of this every day by the powers that be, they're two different things. And I have no business over there. But I come over there to shoot the breeze with the clinical assistants and the residents and poach candy from your bowl. Nice. Exactly. Um, but the reason that I'm here today is because of something that happened, and it's almost exactly two months ago this month, two years ago this month, two years ago. I was over in the uh, administration wing, and I'm eating lunch in the lounge with some staff, and there's counselors in there. They're everywhere here, you know. They're all over. You can't even get away from them. And so I, I'm not listening, of course, but I couldn't help but overhearing they're talking yada, 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 DBT, yada, 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 DBT. And DBT, did that mean anything to me? Did that mean anything to you when you came? No, OK. So I leaned over and I said, DBT, what are you talking about? And one of the counselors turned to me and said, oh, well, that's dialectical behavior therapy. I said, oh, yeah, now I've got it. <laughs> and so when they left, the last one out of the room, I snagged them. I said, imagine for a moment I had no idea <laughs> what you're talking about when you say dialectical behavior therapy. What would you say? And bless their little heart, they did try to explain it to me. And maybe it's because I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But I got to tell you, when they left, I didn't know a thing about it. And it sounded to me like a bunch of namby-pamby, sensitive, new age guy BS. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I see some heads going like that. Yes, I'm sorry. Man thinking, guilty. OK. And so I thought, well, what difference does it make to me? Because I don't have any business in treatment anyway. And DBT is a treatment issue. So. I went back, and that weekend, I was talking to my youngest son in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's a history teacher, and he is about the smartest guy I know. Whenever there's anything I don't know, I usually bring it up to him. And I was talking to him, and I thought, DBT. I said, Isaac, do you know about DBT? So now he's a high school history teacher, right? He goes, oh, yeah, I know all about that, dialectical behavior therapy. <laughs> I said, you? A history teacher in a high school know all about DBT? He said, absolutely. He said, I made a presentation about it. He said, I'll send it to you. OK, so he did. And it's not what we're going to look at today. But it kind of piqued my interest, because my main question was, I had an opinion about DBT, but that really doesn't matter. <laughs> and I thought, why are we encouraging our residents to practice these DBT skills? I mean, what is this about? And when I saw his little presentation, it started to make a little sense to me. So I said to myself, I am going to find out what this is about. So one of the counselors gave me six hours of CDs. <laughs> from this, the woman who invented DBT, Marsha Linehan. And I listened to it in the car when I was driving. And I got a little bit more of an understanding about what it was. And then I made a presentation for myself. Because as a prevention specialist, one of the things that I do is spend most of my time out in the community helping the public understand what addiction is. Because does the general population understand addiction? Not even. They're clueless. And so honestly, my own personal job description is helping the community understand that. And I do that with presentations. But when I make a presentation, does it also help me understand? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I made a presentation about DBT. And it's not so much about DBT, because we're going to talk about that the last five minutes. It's about why do we spend any time practicing DBT skills? That's what it's about, basically. And I did it, and keep this in mind, to describe for myself what this was about. So let's get started here. The first question, and I'm going to ask you this, this works every time, so make sure it works with you guys, OK? <laughs> Do you know people who have made similar alcohol or other drug choices to your choices, and they're not here, and they're not diagnosed with an addiction? That is, do you know people who drank or used like you did, and they're not here? And they, they don't have an addiction, allegedly. Right. And then they usually everybody, yeah, all right. OK, well, that doesn't seem fair. Yeah, that, that pisses a guy off, doesn't it? That doesn't seem fair, does it? OK, so the question, why me? Because that's where I started. OK, so why me? And that's a reasonable question. And so I think I can answer that. I think I can answer that. And so we're going to go to my little whiteboard right here. So I'm going to draw this. This is, OK, that's supposed to be a 0. Now I'm going to use alcohol in this example, as an example. And I'm not picking on alcohol. It's just a psychotropic. That's a, drug, uh, that's a drug that affects the way your brain functions. So that's a word you need to become conversant in, psychotropic. Every drug isn't psychotropic. If I step on a nail and I get an antibiotic, is that psychotropic? Penicillin? No. OK. So alcohol, as far as I'm concerned, is a psychotropic drug like anything else. 
The only reason I'm using it for an example is it is the most available consumer commodity in the United States. Here in Cerro Gordo County, where you are, there are more liquor licenses than all of the gas stations, grocery stores, clothing stores, and banks combined. Let's do that again. There's more liquor licenses here than all the grocery stores, clothing stores, banks, and gas stations put together. It's the most available. You know, so what would we be talking about? But keep in mind, no matter, and I don't know anything about anybody here, but no matter what your substance is, the general principle is the same. So this is how much I'm going to have to drink for the next year. Zero. And I don't just say that and go do what I want to. I really don't have a drink. I don't even smell the cork. I don't even pop a tab, not once, in 365 days. I've never been diagnosed with alcoholism. I don't have alcoholism. Is there any chance that in that next 365 days from today that they're going to take me in a counselor's office and diagnose me with alcoholism? Okay, so I see some, most of the heads going like this, right? Occasionally, there's a person that'll say, yeah. And of course, that's just, I just ask for your opinion. You can't be wrong about an opinion, right? <laughs> so I'm fine with that if you went like this. But I typically ask the person that says, yeah, I think so. What substance causes alcoholism? It's not a trick question. Alcohol. alcohol, right. Am I drinking any of it in the next year? No, and I don't have alcoholism right now. So it looks to me like your perception, which agrees with me, is zero won't do it. All right, let's propose a different number. OK, instead of zero drinks, whoa, 10,000 drinks in the next year. I did the math for you. You know, I always say that I did the math for you. Who did I do the math for? Me. I did the math for me, which took a little calculator. That's 27.4 drinks a day. OK, now there is a definition for a drink. A drink is any alcoholic beverage that contains a half an ounce of pure alcohol. So, you know, logically you could be thinking, who made that up? That's just arbitrary, you know. Pfft. But let's look at this. In a normal old can of beer, there's how many ounces? 12. 12 ounces. 12 ounces in normal old beer is about, and I'm not saying every can is like this, but it's about 4%. 4% times 12 ounces is 0.48 ounces of alcohol. Well, right. A half an ounce is 0.50, so I'm within 200. You've got to give me that one. It's approximate, okay? So that makes the half an ounce seem, well, God, I guess if you were going to define a drink as anything, a can of beer would be a pretty good place to start. Now, wine, on the other hand, has more alcohol in it than beer. It's about 12% on average. So if I just drink four ounces of that, I got exactly the same number. Same number. So four ounces of beer is a drink, 12, four, 12 ounces of beer. Four ounces of wine is a drink, and one shot of 100 proof, because a real shot glass, and you notice I emphasize real. <laughs> Because people call all kinds of things shot glass, right? Yeah, right. I, you know, I've got friends that call a jelly jar a shot glass, but that doesn't make it so, right? <laughs> a shot glass holds one ounce. Well, if I've got 100 proof in there, 100 proof is 50% alcohol, and if I've got an ounce of it, then half of that is alcohol. One shot's also a half an ounce. So tonight I'm going to go home, and I'm going to start, and I'm going to drink 27 beers. And tomorrow I'll go home, and I'll drink... 28 four ounce glasses of wine. The next day I'm going to go home, I'm going to drink 27 shots of 100 proof, and I'll mix it up, but I do that every day. Now, all I'm looking for is a perception. If I started doing that today and I did that for the next 365 days, would you think there's a chance they'd be taking me in a counselor's office sometime in that next year and diagnosing me with alcoholism? Okay, so I'm seeing some agreement on that, okay? Now, stop and think what you believe. This is constantly fascinating to me. Every group of residents I've ever done this with, and this is the 51st time I've given this, and, every, and I do a similar presentation with this little exercise out in the public, so the Kiwanis, the Rotarians, school staff and stuff like that, hospital personnel. Everybody's on board with you. But you know what? Nobody asked me. You said, by God, I hope to shout. Normally, there would be somebody who says, if you're not dead yet. But right, that is doable. Right, some of us know that. that that's doable, right. OK, but here's the thing. Nobody said to me, are you Irish? Is your wife cheating on you? Did you just lose your job, right? No, you know, are you stressed? You're under a lot of stress, right? Nobody asked me any of those things that our culture tells us, well, that's what happened to him. You know, he was, no, no. <laughs> you simply said, God, I hope to shout. So stop and think what you believe, and this is what I find everybody believes, and yet we don't really base our, you know, the way we respond to this based on this understanding. It's just a number.
There's one more dimension to that. Besides it just being a number, it's in a certain span of time. Because if I could live for 10,000 years, God forbid, right, that'd be one drink a year. Is one drink a year going to cause me to develop alcoholism? No. So it's a certain number in a certain span of time, exactly. And your perception, and again, we're not saying whether this is absolutely right or wrong. I'm just, you know, what are you thinking? That it's a certain number in a certain span of time. All right, come on in. Make yourself comfortable. So now here, let's... There's more that you know about this. There's more that you know about this, because you came up with this. This was not my theory, and this, but it is. But, I mean, you came up with this. If we would, if nobody in here had alcoholism, if we'd all start doing this today, would we all be diagnosable on exactly the same day? No. So that's the difference that genetics plays. And we don't know everything about this, but we do know some things about it. If I have a first-degree relative, which is a parent, grandparent, or sibling, that has alcoholism, whether it's been diagnosed or not, I have four times more risk for developing it than somebody who doesn't have a first-degree relative. Doesn't mean it's going to happen to me. I don't inherit an addiction. It looks to me like you're saying i got to work at it, <laughs> which is the way it works. Right. But if I have that first-degree relative, I don't have to work at it so hard. You now, stop and think with me for a minute here. Now, this takes a little thinking. If this is, this is the average guy, he doesn't have any first-degree relative, there's his number, whatever it is, in a year. If I have that first-degree relative, I have more risk than he does. I know risk is an abstract term, but doesn't risk mean that it would happen to me easier, quicker, sooner? I mean more risk. Easier, quicker, sooner, then tell me that. If this guy doesn't have a first-degree relative, and I do, I've got more risk, is my number lower than his or higher than his? Lower. Lower, exactly. Because... What can you get to quicker and faster? A lower number or a higher number if you're starting from zero? You get to the lower number quicker, right? Okay. So you know that too. Not everybody has the same amount of risk. Everybody has some risk because you said, yeah, I hope to shout. But not everybody has the same risk. Some people don't have to work at it so hard. All right. And one more thing about this is different substances. Let's not be picking on alcohol. Do I have to have as many hits of meth as I do cans of Bud Light to develop an addiction? Or is one way more addictive than the other? Oxycodone more addictive than alcohol? Yeah, I think, okay. So there's a, there's a gradient here as far how addictive things are. Once I have the addiction, it's basically everybody's on the same plateau. <laughs> everybody's in the same place. But some people, the number, you know, for a more addictive substance, then if this is my level for developing addiction to alcohol, developing an addiction to more addictive drug would be lower. Right. Okay. So, so you, under, you understand that. This is, gets me because the whole world understands that, and yet that's not the way we operate. Don't you hear people saying, well, you know what happened to her. I mean, her husband was doing, yeah. No. No, I can tell myself any story I want, but the question is, and you've got it, how hard do I work at it? So that's why me. You know, the people that you know that were using more than you are, they're not here yet. <laughs> they haven't developed an addiction yet. If they keep working on it, now they could stop, and if they're not there, it won't happen. But if they keep working on it, they'll be there. So that's the why me. I used a certain amount in a certain span of time. Boom, now I'm diagnosable. What does that mean? What happened is the question, right? What happened? Because this is a misunderstood term, right? Addiction, what does this mean? So, okay, so now I'm in the counselor's office, you know, and they say, boom, you've got, you know, an addiction. What does it mean? We've got to understand the brain, and uh, the, the cover for our brain is our skull. Now, I think you're, you're already figuring it out. You've smoked this one. This is not a human. <laughs> this is not a modern human. This is not a modern human. This is Homo habilis, and this is, I think, two and a half million years old. All right, if you take that skull and you tip it upside down, and you can look inside there, there's the cranial vault, and you can fill that with water. That'd be an easy thing to do, right? And then you dip it out, dump, dump it out into a graduated beaker, and milliliters is the same as cubic centimeters, you know, the displacement of like your motorcycle, 500 cc's. We can tell exactly how much space is in that cranial vault very easily. And we know how much brain matter weighs, right? So you just take that, and that's a pound and a quarter brain in there. Pound and a quarter. There's us, okay. That's Homo sapien sapien, wise, wise man. No self esteem problems with the person that named us, right? Now, that brain's bigger. You can see that. The skull's different. That's a three pound brain. That's a three-pound brain. So we went from a pound and a quarter brain to a three-pound brain. So just exactly what was so advantageous about this big brain <laughs> that nature really basically redesigned our whole skull to fit it? What would you say is the difference here 
between that one and that one. That one. I mean, where where do you see the difference? The main difference. <coughs> right. The dome. The dome there. The big matter of fact. Look at the dome on that kid. <laughs> That's my little grandson. And. He was coming over, he lives in France, so he's coming over to visit us, and this is a couple years ago, my wife says, you gotta go out and buy a crib. And I said, really? I said, I'll just go up in the attic and get his dad's crib. I mean, it's fine, it's not busted up or anything. She said, oh no, they'll never put him in that. I said, why not? She said, well, you know, that's 30 years old, and I don't think the bars are spaced right. I said, did you see the melon on that kid? <laughs> there, there's no, no, there's not getting in between any bars there, whatever, but, did I have to buy a new crib anyway? Yes, I did. Okay, we've got that, <laughs> we've got that figured out. All right, here's what that is. Our brain changed. It didn't just get bigger. It got bigger, but that dome is a whole new structure, a whole new part that we never had and other mammals don't have and reptiles don't have. What's that front structure for? What was that so useful for? Here's the answer. Ben and Jerry's liver and onions ice cream, is that your favorite too? No? No, no good? No. Is there a liver and onions ice cream? No. Now ask, ask yourself this. Did Ben and Jerry go down into their ice cream laboratory, whip up a batch of liver and onions ice cream, take that little tiny spoon and go around to all their employees and say, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think? Or did they simply sit in their office, put their feet up on their desk, look up at the ceiling and think, liver and onions ice cream, yuck. Right, that's what that front part of our brain is for. Simulation, it allows us to simulate. We take information we have, Liver and onions themselves, most people are kind of nasty, and now you take ice cream and you put them together. You do that right up here. That's simulation. Well, how, how useful would that be back in the day when we were developing species, you know? And you go, saber-toothed tiger, okay, and I want to go over and grab what he's eating. Saber-toothed tiger, I've seen him tear something apart. I don't think I'll do that, okay? That works. Simulation was an advantage. So much of an advantage, as a matter of fact, nature redesigned our whole skull. That's what that big dome is for. That's the end, and I don't say the end because we're evolving right now. In a couple, two and a half million years, we'll probably look different if the big meteor hasn't hit the planet or, you know, the volcano hasn't blown up. But that's kind of the end result of this evolution. Addiction happens in the part of our brain that happened, that developed previous to that, previous to that. And it's our brain. And I think we're all on board with that. If I said, what has changed if I have an addiction? What part of my body is different now than it was before? Other parts are affected, but it's my brain. Are we all on board with that? All right. So obviously, it seems useful to understand a little bit of brain anatomy. And I don't expect anybody here to be a neuroanatomist, nor am I myself an expert on this. But it's tough to understand something if you can't visualize it. And I don't know. If there's somebody here, and there could be, that's had the opportunity to handle brain. Um, I have had, and I, I usually say, the privilege of handling a lot of brains. And a lot is a relative term. I'm going to say 50. When I was in college, when I graduated from college, I did an internship with the Dallas, Texas Police Department. And if it was, I wish I could say this, if it was the crime scene investigation unit, that would be so sexy now, wouldn't it? Yeah. But back then in 1974, it was called the ID Bureau. But they did everything. But we couldn't even spell DNA. I mean, we're talking like 40 years ago. But I'll tell you what, these guys are pretty sharp. So I'm the rookie. Now, what's the rookie likely to do to the, at the first crime scene that would really, really screw it up? Because the first crime scene that I worked was a woman had either been jumped and or pushed off a 13-story balcony onto Commerce Avenue in Dallas. And she landed, yes. Throw up. You got it. Okay. Then I don't need to go into the, the grisly details of what this looked like. Right. But right. It would not be unusual for the new guy to puke when he gets to the crime scene. Okay. Well, you know, that wouldn't have been so bad back then because we didn't have DNA. But that would have really been a problem, right, nowadays. Well, but they understood that. So the first thing they did with me is they sent me to the morgue at Parkland Memorial Hospital where they took Kennedy after he was shot. And if you are indigent and you die in Tarrant County, which is Fort Worth, or Dallas County, which is Dallas, you go to the Morgan Parkland Memorial and they still look for a cause of death. How thoughtful is that? Nobody really cares about me, but they want to know why I died, okay? So I would go there for two weeks and there was a technician there and he parted people out. And this guy was a wizard with a scalpel, faster than any doctor because can he lose a patient? No, right, you know, so it's not like, oops, you know, like, eh, hey, what the hell, you know, and so, boom, and you've seen in the crime shows the Y incision, okay, so he opens them up, and so I'm on the other side of the body, and I have this little stack of stainless steel bowls, 
And I take the little bowl, and he puts like the heart in there. And then I have a little scale, and I weigh you know, 300 grams, OK? And then there's this long table, and I set my little bowl over there. And then the next little bowl, and you know, he puts in there liver, 1,500 grams, put that over there, spleen, 120 grams, eh, you know, kidney, 130. And I stack them up. And about once an hour, a medical examiner or pathologist would come into the room. Hi, boys. How you doing? What'd you do this weekend? Set the coffee cup on the body. I always loved that, you know. Yeah. And he goes over, and he looks at my little bench, and he goes, and he looks through the organs, and he picks up one. He goes, ah, oh, look at that. And he would show us, which we didn't know it was, but he was pointing out something. And then he writes a cause of death. All right, well, if you do that for two weeks, pretty soon body parts really, you know, you either find a different job or you kind of get numb to it, okay? So you get numb to it. And one of the things that we took out, and I'm trying to think, brain would be about 1,400 grams, yeah, about 1,400 grams, was the brain. And so I got the opportunity to handle brains. And I have thought many times in this job, this is a tremendous advantage to be familiar with what a brain looks like. So that's what we're going to do. Now, this is an educational video from a doctor, and bless his heart, he made a whole series of these videos for people around the world, because it's on the internet, who don't have access to a, a laboratory or to specimens to examine. His name is Bupendra Gosai, and I think I haven't slaughtered that name. But we're going to look at this, and this is not to gross anybody out. The point here, I want you to think of this. I'm going to propose, after this is over, that we don't have one brain. I know people say a brain, so-and-so's got a brain, and sometimes we say so-and-so doesn't have a brain. <laughs> but we always refer to it as one, one brain. I want you to think there just for a minute, whatever you believe, that there's two brains. And as you watch this video, ask yourself, well, if there's two brains, I think he must be talking about here and here. So that's what I want you to notice as you're watching this. Good evening, friends. Today we will see the different parts of the brain and the various features. Here, as you can see, this is the complete cerebral hemisphere with uh, spinal cord and the brain stem here. Now, as you can see, this is whole central nervous system. Central nervous system is formed by the cerebrum, cerebellum. You can see this brain stem from the midbrain. Okay. The last word that came out of his mouth was midbrain. All right, and you see where he was pointing? He's got it tipped upside down. He had his finger right in the middle of the bottom, I guess we'd say, right? Okay, you know, as when you're working on a car and you drop a part, you go, remember where that went? We'll need that later. Yeah, okay, same thing here. When midbrain, remember where he was pointing in that term midbrain? Pones and medulla oblongata, which continues as the spinal cord. The spinal cord is this one. As you can see, it is up to this point. So this is the spinal cord. So whole length is around 45 centimeters. So these are the different parts of the central nervous system seen in this specimen. Now, as a whole brain, we can see in this specimen, you can see that these are the two cerebral hemispheres, which are separated in the midline by the median fissure. Now, did he cut anything there? Okay, so that's a natural division, right? Okay, right and left half, and you were familiar with that. And here inside, you can see they are connected with each other by the band of fibers known as the corpus callosum. It is a commissural fibers. So these are the two cerebral hemispheres, and they are separated by a fissure, which is occupied by Fox cerebri. Here, this surface, which you can see, is the superolateral surface. And this one, which is medial surface, complete surface, we can see by making a section. And here, when you see upside okay. down, this is the base of the brain. This is the inferior surface of the cerebrum, the orbital part and the tentorial part. But the base of the brain is comprised of not only the inferior surface of cerebrum, but you can see the uh, hypothalamus also, like this mammillary bodies. Okay. Is he not pointing at exactly the same place he was pointing when he said midbrain? Okay, but now this term, mammillary bodies, is just, it's pregnant with meaning. There's a whole, first of all, it suggests we didn't even have that part until we became mammals, right? 
and that it's separate anatomical features right in there, but, but when I use the term from now on midbrain, it's the anatomical features of the brain that we got when we became mammals, and it's the bottom, the middle of the bottom. And you can see this cerebral peduncles of the midbrain, you can see the bones, and you can see this medulla oblongata also. So this whole thing along with the cerebellum seen on each side is the base of the brain. Okay, that's about enough of that. Okay, now this is actually a slide from that video, and he has actually sectioned it now, right? So he's cut it in half, okay? And so this, and going all the way over to his little forceps there, that's the corpus callosum. That's the part that's, that holds it together because when he spread it apart, it looked like it would just keep going, right? But it stops because that corpus callosum is holding the two halves. Here's what I'm proposing, and it's just a suggestion. You know, everything anybody ever tells you is, is a suggestion, right? I mean, if I said the sun wasn't coming up tomorrow, are you believing that? No. So what we really do when we're listening to somebody, we go, I believe that, I believe that, that's BS, I believe that. You know, you're not consciously doing that, but we're doing it. And all I'm suggesting is that everything below the corpus callosum is one brain. And when I say one brain, because it's got its own book of directions, <laughs> it's got its own priorities, and everything above the corpus callosum, that's another brain. So let's, let's have a little drawing here. I'm not an artist, I'll apologize for that ahead of time here. But I've drawn this enough, I think I'm getting pretty good at it. Okay, so what do we got going here? Brain. Thank you, yes. <laughs> a brain, exactly, that's a brain. Now, what's that little hanging down part there? Well, but this is, that would start down here, this is still, he, Brain stem, right, is what we call it. That's the brain stem. Now, that's where involuntary functions are controlled, things that we don't have to think about. Um, respiration, heartbeat, swallowing, blinking. Do you have to think to do any of those things? They happen involuntarily, right? Boom, they happen, okay? Now, the brain is kind of built from the top to the bottom. What I'm proposing is our brain developed more like an onion, you know, inside being bigger, 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 layer over and over and over. The lower we get in the brain, down at the brain stem here, does that part of my brain ever forget anything? No. What would happen if it did? Dead. You'd be dead, <laughs> exactly, you'd be dead. But I can't really teach that part of my brain. The higher you get in the brain, it becomes exactly the opposite. The lower I get, the harder it is to teach anything. It's permanent, it comes with it, I, it's an instinct, I don't learn it, I've got it already but I can't really learn anything down there. The higher I get in the brain, the easier it learns, but it also forgets. Because, do I forget things? Certainly. Sometimes intentionally, sometimes accidentally. I got a new red car, I had a green car, do I walk around in the parking lot for the rest of my life looking for the green car? No, the first day I do, second day I do, finally I, I go, I don't have that anymore. So I forget stuff and I learn things, okay? The higher you get in the brain, easier to learn, harder to forget, the lower you get, The phenomenon of addiction, the health problem of addiction, happens right in that midbrain. Because is that not where he was sticking his finger when he... Yeah, right there. It's not on the outside. We're talking the inside is where those mammillary bodies are. Well, mammillary bodies, what does that have to do with anything? Here's what I'm proposing. Everything under that yellow right there, there's the corpus callosum. This is the mammillary bodies right there. There's my midbrain right in there. And that's where, when I get to my number, Right here, whatever substance, boom, I use enough in a short enough span of time. Now I said the lower you get, the, and I'm going to include myself, the dumber my brain gets, right? But if I show it something that has a tremendous mm, positive effect, or if I use something that has a mild positive effect, but I do it enough times, even this part of my brain finally one day says, hey, I got it. You don't have to show me anymore, I'll show you. Because is this, and, and we can talk about it, this is where I'm going to propose my drives reside. My drives, thirst, hunger, sex, do you have to learn any of that stuff? No, no, that comes pre-programmed. The day I get to my number, I have a new learned drive. And you go, well, you don't learn a drive, they come pre-programmed. No, you typically don't learn a drive, but if you have a psychotropic drug that convinces my brain this is something I need to go for, if I show it enough, and that's just my number, bingo. I have a new learned drive. 
And they have, we have a term for that. We have a term for that. And I'm not much of a speller here, but physiological dependence. Physiological dependence. Now, that in itself is not addiction. That's just that. Physiological dependence is not addiction. And here's why. If I was in the Civil War, and you've seen enough of those reenactments, if I get shot in the arm, what was the way to handle that? How would they do? Typically, they zit saw it off, OK? So now I'm a lucky guy. I don't die from infection. That was probably painful, I'm guessing. Now, they had an analgesic, a pain reliever in the Civil War, syrup of laudanum, all right, made from opium. So if I'm screaming bloody murder and they've got that, are they giving me that? If they've got it, sure. Carefully dosing it or just here, take some and shut up? Yeah, exactly. So finally, I'm healed up enough. They say, thanks for your service. And I'm walking home from Tennessee up to Iowa. I'm out of the camp maybe six, seven hours. And all of a sudden, I get the chills. And then I walk a little bit more. And now I'm sweating. And then pretty soon, I'm throwing up. What's going on? I'm having withdrawal, right? But they gave me all kinds of crap in that hospital. I have no idea what's going on. You put a gun to my head and say, what's the problem? All I can tell you is I'm sick. I'm sick. My brain is physiologically dependent. And when I say that, we're talking real visible brain changes. There's a scan. You know about a CAT scan, a computer tomography scan. Well, there's a PET scan, positron emission tomography scan. And somebody who can read that can see the brain changes associated with this. See them. Never asked me a question, doesn't know who I am, looks at that PET scan, says that person's got an addiction. That's why there are actual physical changes in my brain at that point. That's not an addiction yet. That's not an addiction. Here's what I'm proposing. We started out, and, and we could have the evolution talk, and we can do that later, but I'm just proposing. Does a fish have a brain? Yeah, yeah a little smooth little brain, a little tiny thing like that, OK? And then if, if, in fact, the fish did evolve into more amphibians and then reptiles, right, they've got a little more of a brain going on. And then eventually, there's a, some kind of a primate. And so that's got the mammal brain in it, all right? So I'm saying the brain was and then and then as evolving with these things, more of a brain. Well, what is it when he said mammillary bodies, what did I get here? Now, I got to tell you, this two brain thing is not my idea. <laughs> This is, you see, I got this off the internet. And this is called, how many brains did this guy think you had? Three. three. He thinks you had three. His name was Paul McLean, and he is a, a physician and a neuroscientist back in the 1960s. And he thought, you know, there's three brains. And here's what he named them. The reptilian brain, OK. And then when we became mammals, a new brain. Paleomammalian is ancient mammal brain, OK. So you go, OK, so that's a new part. But what good was that? What did it do? What did it do? I sent myself an email. It's lonely being a prevention specialist. If I don't send myself an email, I don't get any. I don't even have spam. But I sent myself this. And what's that little exclamation mark? What does that mean when you get an email that has that on there? Exactly. That's what emotions did. That's the advantage we got as mammals. So imagine this. You're on a canyon wall out west. Um, there is a little squirrel sitting in this limber pine tree. And down at the bottom is a snake. They don't know each other there. They're looking off in the distance, and all of a sudden, they can hear crackling. They can smell smoke, and they see this big orange wall coming towards them. Which one of those is going to be scared to death by that? The squirrel, right. He's a mammal. He's got the emotion part. He's going to be more likely to survive. The snake is just saying, oh, orange. <laughs> and maybe if he doesn't make it to a hole in the ground soon enough, he's going to get burned up. This is a tremendous advantage. Emotions add impact to what we see. They add importance to us. Should I be jazzed about that? <laughs> Should I be happy about that? Should I be mad? Should I be sad? That's what we got in the mammillary bodies, OK? That's what that's about. It was a tremendous advantage until a substance that fools my brain into thinking this is advantageous is added to it. What are the basic results of this, this physiological dependence? Number one. And they're not you know, in order. I'm just, these are some of the changes. Sensitization. And I'm sure you've had to talk about triggers, right? Sensitization is this. This is this part of my brain. Remember when I said if I use to a certain amount, that part of my brain says, you don't have to remind me. I'll remind you. <laughs> OK, reminding me is sensitization. 
when I see people I used to use with, when I go by the place I used to drink, when I hear songs that I used to associate with drinking, when I see friends that I used to use with, when I smell smells, oh yeah, that part of my brain wakes up and says, oh, go for it. Something that never did anything before. Five years ago, you're in my apartment, you open a bottle of beer, the foam comes over on the floor, I go, oh my God, what a mess, I go get a towel and just like clean it up. Five years later, I hear the psh, I see the foam, it's like, a feeling, uh, right, that's, that's new, and that's right in there, that's right in there. Because, remember, the mammillary bodies, the thing I got with the mammillary bodies is emotion, right? Don't drives give us emotion, that's how they get our attention. <laughs> Another change, reduced ability to weigh risks. Have you had the gambling talk, have you had uh, somebody come in here and talk about gambling, and, and you might have legitimately thought, gambling, what is this about? Like, what's the deal? Well, here's what happened. My brain now, physiologically, is not as capable of weighing risks as it was before. Well, isn't gambling just a matter of weighing risks? <laughs> That's basically all it is, right? That's all it is. And if I have an addiction to a substance, my brain is not as effective at looking out for my own best interest, i.e. weighing risk as it was before. So gambling may, may be a whole different thing for me now that I have an addiction to a substance. And finally, less reward from normal things. I mean, it used to be, I love fishing and I'm standing there and I've been in the river for 15 minutes, haven't got anything yet, and then all of a sudden I get a hit. Oh God, there he is, he's a nice one. And I got a little vut from that. Well, how does that vut compare to cocaine? No, no, it just doesn't do it. It doesn't do it. We use this term that these substances that have the potential for addiction are behaviorally toxic. That is, my brain will choose them over anything else. And normal things don't give me the response that they used to. Those are, those are changes. Those are, those are changes in my brain. But... If this took a while, and especially with alcohol, it takes a while, marijuana it takes a while, I'm learning things. We're learning every day. Every time we get up, we've, we're learning something, whether we think we are or not. What am I learning? Social dependence. If I can drink a 12-pack and just function fine and talk fine and walk around, can everybody do that or just some people do that? Some people can do that. Well, who am I going to start to hang out with? Because my regular friends are going to look at, they look at the end of the coffee table when we're done watching the game, and I know that they're saying to each other, my God, did you see how much he drank tonight? Well, I don't want to be talked about like that. So I'm going to start hanging out with people who can do what I do. And it's completely normal because don't we like to associate with people who like to do what we like to do? Isn't that completely normal? I'm a trap shooter. I got friends who are trap shooters. I like to fish. I got friends who are fishermen. This is completely normal. But what we're talking about is, now I'm starting to hang out with people who are using the way that I do. And when I stop and think, is this risky or not, I can say, well, this is no risk to this man. Bob had that happen twice last year. It's no big deal. Phyllis, you know, you know. And it all seems to become normal. Well, are normal things dangerous? No, the most dangerous time of the day is when I get in my car, but are we scared to death when we get in the car and drive? No, because it's so normal. And social dependence makes everything that's happening in my life seem completely normal. State-dependent learning. What I learn to do when I'm, with alcohol, it's about point away to point one. What I learn to do when I'm drunk or high, I can actually do it better. And people, and I say people, the general public perceives that I'm just thinking I'm better. Well, later on, way later on in this process, I will just think and I'm not better. But it, it's real. If I learn to bowl, and I'm gutter ball, gutter ball, gutter ball, and then I have something to drink. If I learned to bowl when my blood alcohol level was like over 0.08, and it's not, I'm not picking on alcohol because state-dependent learning happens with every substance, I'm really better. I'm really better. If that's the way I was when I learned it, I'm better doing it. Now, obviously, there gets to be a point where, you know, if I can't learn to dance if I can't stand up, right? <laughs> so th this is not, you know, into infinity. But there's a window where I'm at this certain level of my alcohol or drug use when I'm actually better. And so I can legitimately say to myself, I'm better when I'm this way. And I mean it and I believe it and my experience confirms that. I am better. And withdrawal learning. Withdrawal learning. I'm having withdrawal. 
I feel like I'm dying, I have a drink or I use again and I feel better. And when my boss says to me, can't you see what this stuff is doing to you? It's killing you. I can look at him, I can legitimately say, killing me? Are you kidding? It's the only thing keeping me alive. Exactly. All of that is learned behavior, right? I learned that everybody does this. Well, that's because the people that I hang out with, everybody does do it. I learned that. That's not a brain change. I learned that I'm better at this because I learned it when I was using. I learned that and withdraw learning. Learning goes on up here. This is the neocortex. If we look at, and we will in a minute, uh, that Dr. McLean's diagram again of the brains, the neocortex, the new human part of our brain, that's where the learning goes on. And there's a name for those things too, and that is psychological dependence. Okay, that's learned behavior. Now, We've all, and I mean we all, I mean everybody on the planet, has had this battle, I want to, I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to. I mean, it, that, that's not exclusive to addiction, is it? That, there's, that goes on with everybody on a regular basis. I want to, I don't want to. I want to, I don't want to, that battle. There's got to be a part in our brain that says, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> I mean, really, you know, the seat of second sober thought, as we call it. There it is right there. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and guess where it is? It's in the dome. Because what it's been doing is it simulates. It goes, you know what happened the last time you did this? <laughs> and it's putting together my past experience, and it's saying, uh, you don't want to do that again, OK? Right, but let's stop and look at this. Here's my dorsolateral prefrontal cortex right here. That's telling me, no, wait a minute. Let's not do this anymore. This part of my brain is giving me physical feelings, right? Emotion telling me. If you can possibly get it, go for it. And this part of my brain has learned, yes, absolutely. And it gives me excuses. You haven't used it all week. You owe yourself. You worked really hard. You know, you deserve a treat. And it's in on it. So I've got this part giving me feelings that makes me want to use again. This part is giving me cognitive, rational, word explanations of why it's OK. It's OK. you got to go for it. Well, isn't that too against? One, how do those two against one fights turn out? They win. Yeah, the two win, the two win. That's exactly what residential treatment is about. As I say, we assist people in their abstinence. Because two against one, I'm not winning that. I'm not winning that. That's why the primary symptom of addiction is loss of control. I cannot control my use. Now, do not be confused the difference between control and abstinence. And this took me a while to figure out. Control means I'm using, but I can start, stop, do whatever I say I'll do, I can do it. Abstinence is I'm not doing it at all. When I have these two changes together, I can stop altogether because that's not controlling, really, is it? I'm not controlling anything because I'm not using. What I cannot do is control. And so now these two things together now that's an addiction. Now I have an addiction. This part of my brain has given me physical cravings and they're telling me, you want to get this. And this part of my brain has given me cognitive reasons why it's OK to do that. What I have done is I have created my own new worst enemy. This part of my brain right down here, where the mammillary bodies are, that's changed. And I mean changed. Now you've probably heard this. Is an addiction a chronic health problem? That is, chronic means I'm going to have it forever. But let's stop and think about this. Is diabetes a chronic health problem? I mean, if I got diabetes, do I ever not have diabetes? No. And there's all kinds of people managing their diabetes, right? But chronic means it's going to be there forever. I have created my own new worst enemy. And you know what I was thinking about here the other day? How powerful is that part of my brain? Because you know the general public says, oh, just knock it off. Okay, well, they're not feeling what I'm feeling. Their brain has not had these changes. They have not had this experience. They have not had this change. They don't understand. They cannot understand. Just knock it off. But my question to myself was, well, how powerful is this? And I got to thinking about this. Have you heard the term air hunger? Okay, when you, you've seen enough cop shows, when they pull somebody out of the water, the first thing the medical examiner looks for is, do they have water in their 
lungs. lungs, exactly. And if they have water in their lungs, the theory is that they drowned, right? And if they don't have water in their lungs, they were dead when they threw them in. Okay. Well, now stop and think about this for a minute. If I have water in my lungs, what was I doing underwater? Breathing. Right. I, I wasn't just trying. I was getting it done. All right. Don't we know not to do that? I mean, I'm thinking if I gave everybody a true-false test, breathing underwater will kill you, you know, you'd all get that right. Everybody would get an A on that one, right? That's how powerful that part of my brain is. Air hunger is, a, if you've ever held your breath for a long time when you really didn't want to, do you get a physical feeling? That's how powerful that is. And learning, that's hugely powerful too. Do you remember Indiana Jones and the, and, uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark where... She, that woman had to save him from where the ceiling was coming down, the big spikes were coming down, she had to reach in that hole and pull the lever. If she would have reached in that hole and come back with a stump, if you would have said to her, put your other hand in there? No. And would it have taken two or three big men to get that little woman's hand into that hole? That's how powerful learning can be. Well, now I've got two of these things, and they're all giving me the same message, and I got one little, the newest part of my brain, the adolescent part of my brain that we just developed, saying, oh, wait, are you sure you want to do this? This is a problem. Now, I'm not going to equate an addiction with tonsillitis, although they both are fatal diseases, <laughs> fatal health problems. But this is Bill Cosby, and he's a kid, and the doctor is explaining to him why he's not going home tonight. He's staying in the hospital. And it has to do with just exactly what we talked about. What has happened to the midbrain? Your tonsils, which we're going to have to take out, guard your throat, you see. They stand there, they're two guards, they have hand grenades, bazookas, and everything, and anything bad that comes into your mouth, they fight it off. <laughs> see, well, uh, in your case, your tonsils have lost the war. Uh, as a matter of fact, your tonsils have gone as far as to join the other side, you see. And they're going to kill you if we don't cut them off. Well, what I'm saying, and again, I'm not, I'm not uh, downplaying the seriousness of these brain changes, but just like he said, right, his tonsils had joined the other side, my midbrain has joined the other side, and it will kill you, but unfortunately, tonsils, I can live without, can I live without my midbrain? No. So you say, whoa, I'm screwed, what do we do about this? Well, that's treatment. <laughs> what, is, what is going on in treatment, okay? This is what I've done to my brain. <laughs> All right, this is what I've done to my brain. Now, honestly, if, if you woke up one morning and you were in that condition and somebody said to you, I will give you $10 million in a year if you can look normal again, could you do that? What would be your plan? Work your left side. Exactly, and don't work the other side. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly what has happened to my brain. It is now out of balance. Every time these two parts won, this part got weaker. That is the reduced ability to weigh risk, right? And all, what I need to do is I need to exercise this part and not exercise that part. And every time I have that battle, and when you leave treatment, are you going to have other opportunities to use? Yes. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And when I have that battle, and I decide not to, these parts get weaker and that part gets stronger. And if I work on that long enough, I will get my brain back in balance. Now, again, always remembering, is this a chronic health problem? Right, right. But I can abstain. But first, I, it's much more likely I'll be successful if I can get my brain back in balance, unlike that guy. So what I'm proposing is, right here, that midbrain is now my new worst enemy. It doesn't care about my health. It doesn't care about my finances. It doesn't care about my family. It doesn't care about my job. It's got its own priority. There's two brains up there. One of them is an ancient brain that just simply goes for the feeling, right? And then my cognitive brain, over time, I have gotten that in on with it. <laughs> and you put those two things together, that's powerful. But the question is, okay, so now what does DBT have to do with any of this? You remember this diagram? Does that look familiar from your little book? Okay. When I looked at that, because I went, when I was trying to figure out what DBT was, they gave me one of those folders, and I looked at that diagram. Did that mean anything to me? No. 
No, it didn't. Okay. But then I thought about this. The emotion mind is anatomically my midbrain, right? And my reasoning mind is up here, my neocortex. Okay, now, now that made some sense to me. Now we'll have a little brief history lesson, and what have I got pictured here? Right, December 7, 1941. The, it did turn out good. 1,500 dead sailors, the uh, Pacific Fleet was decimated, and yet six months later, six, can you rebuild a Navy in six months? Not even, you yeah, not even started. The Japanese had a plan. There's Japan right there, okay? And here's Hawaii. And what they basically wanted with Pearl Harbor is they wanted the United States to just stay away. <laughs> just stay away and let us have our area of dominance right here. And we're going to be the big king there. We're going to take over. Well, Pearl Harbor was a big blow, but they thought it's not enough. They still have some ships, but if we do that one more time, they'll just give up, okay? So they have a plan. They're going to fake uh, invasion of the Aleutian Islands right there, but when they get out here, they're going to turn, and that little dot there is Midway Island. Here's actually a contemporary. Now, the United States had those little airfields on there. That's all it is. There's Sand Island and East Island, and one's three miles long, and one's a mile long. There's nothing. There's nothing. It's out in the middle of the Pacific. But they thought, if we can capture that, we will have an outside perimeter for our area of dominance, and if we sink all their ships when they come to kick us out of there, they'll leave us alone. Good plan. Sounded good. They came with four aircraft carriers. We had three. They left with no aircraft carriers. And I got to thinking that how many planes do you lose when you're in the middle of the Pacific and you lose all your aircraft carriers? Oh. All of them. That's exactly all of them. 248 planes they lost, right? They had 3,500 people dead. The United States had 350 or something like that. I'm not discounting that. But it was a huge victory for the Americans who were outnumbered in manpower and ships. Well, how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, here's how they did that. Armed with key intelligence on enemy plans, outnumbered U.S. forces, mauled the Japanese. It was the most decisive naval victory of World War II. And the reason that the outnumbered American Navy won is because they already knew what the Japanese were going to do. They had broken their code. They had broken their code. Aha, aha. So what I'm suggesting is there's a lesson here about staying in recovery. This is Sun Tzu, the art of war. Sun Tzu is a Chinese general that died 2,500 years ago. But his treatise called The Art of War, and are you familiar with that? Have you heard of that? It's studied in military academies the world over. West Point, Annapolis, the whole world. You study this because he had it figured out. How do you win a battle? I'm proposing that my midbrain is now my new worst enemy, and will I have other battles in the future when I get out of here? Is the work over when you leave treatment or just beginning? Yeah. Right. When I get out, this is the clue to winning every battle. Sun Tzu says, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. And if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Who's my worst enemy? My midbrain. What's the language of this midbrain? It's not words. What is it? Feelings. Right. Feel it. Emotion. Right. Emotion and feelings. Right. That's the part of DBT. That's the part. And I, I do mindfulness every morning. I sit down. And what I try to do is shut off this and listen to this. Listen to that. That's one of the reasons DBT, because what my question was and why I made this presentation is, why do we even encourage anybody to practice these DBT skills? Well, if I look at this as the way that addiction happened, then having advanced intel on what that part of my brain wants me to do, that gives me the advantage to win every battle. There's the, and, I, and this is three brains, and, and whatever is useful for you is the way to think about this, but I'm proposing that your brain has got two parts in it, and one part has priorities that aren't necessarily in your own best interest, and now it's joined the other side. That's down there, the midbrain. And here's my thinking brain, my reasoning brain up here. Well, knowing myself is, 
if I understand what happens, right, and you're going to practice skills, and you already have here, to use in the future tools, right, to get the kind of decisions that will be in your own best interest. That's knowing myself. If I put those two things together, know the enemy and know yourself, Sun Tzu says, I can win in every battle. So when you see this diagram again, if it's any use to you at all, think of it as brain parts. The emotion mind, right here, my midbrain. And my reasoning mind, right up here, my neocortex. When I come into here, I've got some thoughts, <laughs> and I know some things, but they can be replaced with information that I now think maybe is more useful to me. That's going to be my reasoning mind, and I put those two things together. That's the secret to staying in recovery. Now, when I am about to do something irrational, I should have just put, I'm about to use again, right? Because that's what I mean. You know, that's what I mean. And there's somebody with me who really cares about me. This is what they might say. Now, we're going to play Wheel of Fortune here. So, okay, this is what somebody's going to say to me when I'm about to use again somebody who really cares about me and is concerned about me. Ask for a letter. I'm ready. O. o. W. No W's. D. <laughs> I got to think because I'm not much of a speller, but no, there's no D's. E. e. T. Wait, I'm thinking here. Um, T. Uh, yes. Stop and think. Stop and think. That's the other part of DBT. DBT is not just about listening to the midbrain and getting intel on the enemy. It's also about, whoa. <laughs> it's also, and that's what Isaac, my son, sent me. The funny little presentation he sent me was a long, skinny store. And <laughs> he had drawn it. I don't know how I got on a slide. And he had it arranged exactly the opposite of the way stores are really arranged. Because the things they want you to buy on impulse, uh, the gum, cigarettes, uh, lighters, and stuff like that, where do they put those? Right by the cash register, right by the cash register, okay? And Isaac's store was exactly the way. He had all the impulse stuff over here when you came in, and you had to walk like a quarter of a mile to get to the cash register. And, I, I, and you've had this happen before. You're walking through the grocery store, and you see something totally out of place. And the other day, I saw a bag of potato chips sitting on a the pile of can of green beans, okay? A pile of one bag of potato chips. How do those things get like that out of place? Well, right, people are moving them. But I picked up the potato chips, ooh, those look good. And I'm walking along, and I'm thinking, and before I get to the cash register, I'm thinking, I don't think I really want this, right? And I put it down, OK? The longer I can wait before I act, the more likely this is going to be in my own best interest. So that's why DBT is stop and listen to the enemy, <coughs> gather intel. It's two parts. And the DBT. You know, contrary to what I thought, a bunch of, you know, namby-pamby, sensitive, new age guy BS, is really a tool, a tool actually based on, that is, we have a 2,500-year-old Chinese general giving us the rules for staying in recovery, right? I have a new worst enemy, and I can win every battle if I stop and listen to what that part of my brain wants me to do, and then think about whether that's in my own best interest, and don't react right away. That's what the DBT skills are. So I'm just proposing that's a way to think about it. This is just a model. This is just a model of just exactly what went on. If that's useful to you and helps you stay in recovery or think about this issue, take from it what you will. Thank you for your attention, gentlemen. If you have any questions while I'm cleaning up here, you're certainly welcome to ask them. Other than that, I don't know. It's 10 o'clock. What's happening next? Break. Break? Okay, take a break.